continuing our discussion of double integrals, let's take a look at, okay, rectangles are great, but life isn't limited to just rectangles. You know, let's take a look at different re input regions that we could possibly integrate over. So rectangles are great. Do we always have to integrate over them? No, we can extend everything that we've seen so far to general closed bounded domain regions in the plane. So uh, in order to think about this, what we're gonna do is to set up your integral, you're gonna think about slicing along one axis of the domain, and that's gonna give you your outer integral. And then those slices are gonna have a top and a bottom, kind of similar to the pictures I was drawing in the domain of integration on the prior section. But let's take a look at, um, you can uh, click on that, it's, it's the same thing we saw in the last, the GeoGebra link is the same thing we saw in the last lecture, so I'll let you explore that on your own. But let's take a look at this and just set this thing up. Say, hey, I want to calculate the area of this region and set up the area integral. I haven't written that anywhere, but let's just say that that's our goal. Well, from last time, we know that area uh, can be found as the double integral over the region R, let's just call this region R, um, of the area differential. And that, that can be dx dy or dy dx, as we saw last time. So instead of thinking x's and y's here, let's just think what the bullet points suggest. Let's do some vertical slices. Well, the first thing, before we think about vertical slices, maybe we should label these things. All right, so our top, so well, I should not use the word top. Uh, this is y is equal to the square root of x. And this is y is equal to x to the third power. Notice we're just in that little zero to one square in the first quadrant. So I'm going to take vertical slices. So let's go ahead and draw in what does a vertical slice look like? Well, a vertical slice looks like this. There's vertical slice. Okay, so how do I need to let this slice vary? Well, in order to get the entire area, I'm going to need to let this slice vary along the x-axis from 0 to 1. I'm going to change the x direction and have lots of little slices as we go. That's going to give us our outermost integral. And so we will first start by giving our integral there and slapping our outermost differential on there. First thing I label is the differential, the change of the, what do I need to let vary for those slices? Then I can come over here and say, OK, I want to let bit x vary from 0 all the way to 1 to generate, uh, to generate slices that will fill that entire area. So now, once you've got those put in, well, the only thing left is we need to let y vary now. And so now this innermost integral is going to be with respect to y. And so this slice has this as the top point and this as the bottom, if you will. Those are the, the top and the bottom of the y height, the y height of those so-called slices. All right, so what are the uh, top and bottom expressions for those going to be? Well, think about what we want to happen over here in this integral. What do we want to happen over here? Well, we're integrating with respect to y, so we want to be substituting in for y as our expressions. And so I think things are okay the way they are. I can just write y is equal to the square root of x and y is equal to x to the third for the the upper and lower limits of those vertical slices. And when I do that, I'll, I will uh, evaluate the integral, I'll plug in for y, and I'll get an expression only in x, which will work for the outermost integral. OK, so I, I don't have two slides here, and I don't really want to lose all of that. And so we'll just switch to another color for horizontal slices. OK, so what does a generic horizontal slice look like? So I'll just start here with a horizontal slice and say, OK. And you know what's sometimes helpful is to kind of draw a line and say, OK, the slices, we're going to work from left to right. And that's that's what I do. here, as I see that we're doing horizontal slices, well, I want them to go from the bottom to the top. I want to let 
why they'll oh, see spoiler i couldn't i couldn't say it without saying why but yeah i'm, I'm noticing that uh to generate this entire area of this domain uh, of integration i want to start and let y vary from zero to one so i'm going to have delta y be the direction of change for the slices so that's going to give me my outermost integral again so once again integral bar start with the outermost differential and then put in your limits here okay so y is going to vary from zero to one now for my inner integral i'm left with no choices it has to be with terms of x and so now i have to fill in those x uh, limits of integration but i know they need to be of the form x equals and so what am i going to do to fix this well from this What's my top and bottom of this slice? Well, this now is the top because that's the more positive in the x direction. And this over here is the bottom. So I need this to be in an expression in terms of x. And so we look up at y is equal to square root of x. Well, squaring both sides, we get x is equal to y squared. And so sure enough, that can be x is equal to y squared. There's the expression for our bottom of our horizontal slice. Similar logic over here to find the x equals expression for my top of my horizontal slice i look over here and say okay raise both sides to the one third power i get y to the one x is equal to y to the one third power and there's my top so we'll go ahead and fill in those and we've got on the bottom we've got x is equal to y squared and on the top we have x is equal to y to the one third power So I talked that through without actually kind of presenting any method. So let's present the general method of what I just tried to explain there. First things first, always, always, always sketch your domain of integration. If it's hard to sketch the graph, feel free to use a tool like Desmos. I almost always do. Uh, but then transfer a sketch of what you find out on Desmos onto your paper so that you can label the horizontal and vertical slices and see where they need to vary from in order to generate the whole domain. Choose whether or not you're going to integrate uh, uh, using vertical slices or horizontal slices. Um, whoops, that was two at once. The outer integral, that's going to be the max range of the slices. You're going to let the slices range from what value to what value to generate the entire um, domain region. And then the inner integral is going to be with respect to the minimum and maximum so-called height of those slices. And that's always going to be a function in terms of the other variable. But if you set it up like I suggest, it helps you to, to make sure your variables are all in the right place that things will work correctly, matching those differentials to the limits of integration. So here's, let's start with another example. Here we're going to try and find the area of a triangle with vertices at 0, 0, 1, 2, and 3, 2. So it's pictured nicely off there to the right. And in order to do this, we need to do some vertical slices. Okay, so let's start here. I don't know, let's go back to the black color here. All right, so I'm going to draw an arbitrary vertical slice. Okay, so I'm going to start here, and I'm going to go up like that. I'm going to say, OK, and if I let these slices vary in that direction, I should generate the whole uh, region. But there's a problem. Once I hit this point, this kind of y, uh, x is equal to 1 vertical line, my, my vertical slices are going to have different top and bottom expressions. Um, if I just use this as my top expression, it would the slice would keep going up like that. We don't want that. So in order to use vertical slices to do this particular integral, just as if we were interested in finding the area under, like the actual area trapped between, say, a sine curve, if we just didn't worry about the two regions and just did um, the integral from zero to two pi would get zero because of the signed positive area, negative area thing. And so what we had to do is 
we would break this into two integrals. And I would calculate the area under this using absolute values and then calculate the area over that as well. But point is you have to sometimes break the region up into multiple um, pieces. And that's what we'll do here. So we'll effectively find the area of two triangles and add them together to get the sum total area. I will call this triangle A. And whoops, that's not a very good A. Let's make this a little, not a lot of room in there. So I'll put it outside the triangle. And then we'll call this triangle, triangle B. All right, so for the area for triangle A, we would have area of triangle A in black to match the colors that we're using. Well, what are we gonna do? I see that my slices are vertical. And in order to generate that entire area, I'm gonna to have to let X vary from zero to one. So I know that my outermost integral is gonna be dx first. Uh, and so we're gonna go from x equals zero to x equals one. And that's gonna give me sort of my second step of logic. Now, the third step of logic, we've got the innermost integral has to be dy. And so that tells me that these limits of integration should be with respect to y. Now I need to figure out what these, um, well, what these lines are. Well, I'm just gonna wave my hands and say, this is, well, it goes through zero, zero. So it's gonna be of the form y is equal to mx. And uh, you know, it goes up two and over three. It looks like it's got a slope of two thirds. So that's y is equal to two thirds x. That's gonna be the bottom of my slices. In this case, this is my bottom since we're using vertical slices. Now this is a little more steep. That's got a slope of two. So that's y equals two x and then this topmost is the horizontal line y is equal to two. All right, now we know all the lines. And so for triangle A, our bottom expression is gonna be two thirds, y is equal to two thirds x. And our top expression is going to be y is equal to two x. Now on to triangle B. The area of triangle B, that is going to be, well, again, the same kind of process we know that for triangle B, I need to let these vertical slices vary from one to three. And again, I'm varying in the X direction. So my outermost integral is going to be DX, letting X vary. And we're gonna let X vary from one to three in this case. That tells me that my inner differential is going to be DY. And similarly, but different, our bottom, is going to be y is equal to two thirds x. It shares the same bottom sort of y height as the other one, but the top height changes. y is equal to just straight up two, not two x because it's that horizontal line there. Let's emphasize that a little bit. The differences between these two. So that's great, all good. Two integrals to do. Hmm. Remember when I said I was a little bit lazy? I think I am. I think I would prefer to do this if I could do the problem using only one integral. So let's try and see what happens if we try and set this thing up with horizontal slices. Okay, here I've conveniently labeled those lines, some of them anyway. Oops, how many of these pages do we have? Looks like we have two pages for this. So let's again, talk through this process. All right, back to just a regular old color. All right, so now we're using horizontal slices. And so a generic horizontal slice looks like this. And to generate the whole region, I'm gonna have to let them vary in this direction. So I'm gonna let them vary uh, in the Y direction from zero to two. All right, so that gives me my outermost integral, dy. First step, differential. Second step, label the related limits of integration. I'm gonna let Y vary from zero to two. All right, so now that process of elimination, we've got to use dx for our inside. And now, since it's x, again, this needs to be x equals. So x equals, x equals. And by labeling that first, I can then go over to my picture and I can say, okay, I got to algebra this thing into shape and solve those expressions for x. And when I do that, I get that x is equal to three halves y. And this is gonna be the top because it's my more positive in the x direction. And then over here for my bottom, I see that x is equal to 
one half y, and this is going to be my bottom. Okay, so on our bottom, we have x equals one half y, and on our top, we have x is equal to three halves y. So now for fun, let's uh, calculate this. But before we calculate this, don't forget geometry skills. We can kind of estimate, because this is plotted on a gridded map, what the area to this triangle looks like it might be. So just for fun, let's take an estimate and say, okay, I um, mean, there's, that's almost one unit of area. And then uh, I know this combined with this, put that all together, plus the overestimate of that yellow unit of area. It seems like my answer is gonna be somewhere in the region and neighborhood of area of two. So let's go ahead and calculate this and see what we get. So for our inner integral, we have to do the integral from x equals one half y to x is equal to three halves y dx. Integrating dx gives us x evaluated from those very same limits of integration. Notice that when we do this again, we're going to get an expression entirely in y, which is great because that's what we want it to be because we're going to integrate with respect to y in our outermost expression. So the first is going to be 3 halves y substituted in for x minus not equals uh, 1 half y. 3 halves minus 1 half gives us 1y, so just y. All right, so now it's time to tackle our outer integral. So our outer integral is from y equals 0 to y equals two, integrating y with respect to y. This gives us one half y squared, evaluated from y equals zero to y equals two. Plugging in for two, we get one half times two squared minus one half times zero squared. It's tempting to, whenever you get zero in somewhere, to always cross it out and be zero, but you know, be careful. Sometimes it's not zero, it's one. That's a side point, but it's a common mistake that students make. Anyway, one half times two squared gives us two. And so in fact, the actual area of that triangle is two and our estimate wasn't too far off. In fact, it was pretty darn good. Didn't need that second paper, so. All right, can we always switch the order of integration? It would be nice if we could, couldn't we? Well, as long as things are, quote, nice, yes, we can. This is actually called Fubini's theorem. Um, and this is strong-ish here. You can read the text for the exact statement of Fubini's theorem. But basically what it says is, if R is a closed bounded region in the xy plane, and that's the region that you're integrating over, and z equals f of xy is a continuous function of R, then you can switch the order of integration for an iterated double integral. In other words, the double integral over R of f dx dy is the same thing as the double integral of r of f dy dx, switching the order of integration. Now, will this always be possible? I said, well, as long as things are nice. Um, even when things are nice, sometimes it's not possible. So take a look at this domain of integration here. This sort of, I don't know what to call it square with a circle bite taken out of it or rectangle with a circle bite. Okay, so what could we do? Well, let's try and do vertical slices. Well, spoiler, you can see off to the left that it says you can't do it. That's what that red check is, X mark is supposed to be. Okay, so I would have a vertical slice and I would let it vary like here. But what would happen? Uh-oh, this doesn't seem cool. What are my tops and bottoms? And what about this missing area here? We saw this in, in Calc 2 as well sometimes where we couldn't do an integration in one order, but we could do it in the other order. So yeah, vertical slices will fail in this case. So let's get all this out of here. Let's try again and sketch our horizontal slices and see what we've got. All right, so now horizontal slices. Well, generic horizontal slice looks like this, and I would let it vary from here to here and all the way across. I'm gonna have the same bottom value and the same top value. So we're good to go. You can do this thing using horizontal slices. When I wrote these, I was a big fan of putting the same link to the same GeoGebra applet that we saw last time in there. But uh, I think that this discussion covers that pretty well. So we're not gonna visit that. 
Okay, so let's let's do some examples here. Let's try and find the volume under z is equal to five times sine x over x. Over the region R in the plane, which is bounded by x is equal to pi over two, y is equal to zero, and the diagonal line y equals to x. So let's see if we can get this to open and take a look at what's going on before we start. All right, so this graph is zoomed in a little bit. You can kind of better see what's what's happening. We want to find the volume trapped underneath this curve over that triangle in the plane as the domain of integration. So you can kind of see that, yep, the surface on the top matches that. And I sort of drew some vertical lines down and an imperfectly somewhat shaded to sort of represent the volume of the region that we're going to try and find. So back to our slides. All right, so we've got a few um, a few slides here to work this example that was just kind of introducing what it looks like. Let's go ahead and advance to the next one here. Okay, so what do we want to do? Um, there's always a choice to be made. Do you want to take vertical slices or horizontal slices? Uh, I don't know uh, what's going to be best or anything like that. And so I'm just going to choose horizontal slices and see what happens. It looks like it's possible both ways. And you know, I could do vertical slices, and that would be fine. Uh, or I can do horizontal slices, and that'll be fine as well. So let's try horizontal slices. Horizontal slices. OK, so where are we going to do? There's a generic slice, and sure enough, it's going to have the same top and bottom all the way. What do I need to let it vary? I need to let it vary along this axis. That is the y-axis, so I'm going to let y vary. And so the first thing is my outer integral is going to be dy. And so we'll match the limits of integration there. I'm going to let y vary from 0 to pi over 2. All right, so now the inner integral is going to be dx. So next, we'll make that decision. I'm going to stop numbering these. All right, and then we're going to match the x things. All right, so what do we know here? Uh, well, uh, this line is y is equal to x, or, well, wait a minute, we have an x as our differential, so we want these limits of integration to be x equals, you know, I don't know, x is equal to y, a little easier to see that that's going to be what? That's going to be our bottom, whereas this is our top of our slice. Okay, so I've got the bottom one, x is equal to y. So now what about this one? This vertical line here is x is equal to pi over two, and that's going to be constant for all the slices. So our top is going to be x is equal to pi over two as well. And now last but not least, we're not calculating the area of this region, so we're not going to stop there, but rather we're trying to find the volume underneath the surface, and the surface is given above, and so we need to put our z equals expression in here, five sine of x. And I will apologize, um, my fives and my s's look fairly similar sometimes, so I try and exaggerate my fives a little bit. All right, so let's do this. Let's try and tackle our innermost integral. We're going to integrate from x equals to y to x is equal to pi over 2. And we want to integrate 5 sine of x over x dx. So what do we got here? Well, taking a look at this thing, I don't have any great ideas. I don't think we can integrate this easily. And so that happens. Sometimes you set up your plan of integration and you're like, well, this, this isn't working this way. And what do you do then? Similar to a strategy uh, when a U substitution doesn't work or integration by parts doesn't work, you just try something else. You try a different method. And in this case, the different method is to try vertical slices and see if somehow that solves our problem. So let's do it. Whoops. Oh, I only had two slides in there. All right, I'm gonna pause this, tidy that up and uh, give ourselves room to work again.
All right, now we've got room to continue. So now we're going to horizontal slices failed us. So we'll do some vertical slices. Our vertical slices look like this. We're gonna have our top, uh, well, what are we gonna do? We're gonna let them vary in this direction. And so DX is gonna be our outermost uh, integral. We're gonna have DX be our outermost. So we're gonna let X vary from zero to pi over two. Yep, absolutely. And now for our innermost integral, we're going to let that one's going to be with respect to y. So our limits of integration better be in terms of y equals. And so we just need to identify the top and the bottom for these. And so our bottom is going to be given by y is equal to 0. And our top is going to be given by y is equal to x. And then slap your integrand in there. And now we're integrating with respect to y, so our inner integral, all of that stuff, it's not that it doesn't matter, it just is a constant. And what we're going to get when we integrate 5 sine of x over x, that's a constant. And so to emphasize that, there is, there's, we're just integral dy is the only thing, so 1. And so what we get is, oops, still want that there equals uh, y times five sine of x over x evaluated from y is equal to zero to y is equal to x. Okay, doing that, uh, first substituting in y for x, we get x times five sine of x. Is that parenthesis necessary? No, it's to emphasize that I'm substituting in for y minus substituting in for y is 0 times 5 sine of x over x. Well, that whole expression is 0, so that's good to go. And this, hey, that's pretty nice. Those x's now reduce away and leaves us with a simpler expression to integrate that, you know what, I bet we're going to be able to integrate in this outermost integral. So there's a finish of our inner integral. And so we'll use that as our integrand for our outer integral. And our outer integral lets x range from 0 to pi over 2. And we're integrating the expression 5 sine of x dx. Uh, what has the derivative of sine? Well, negative 5 times cosine of x has derivative positive five sine of x. Evaluate this expression from x equals zero to x equals pi over two. And we're going to arrive at our answer. Okay, so negative five times cosine of pi over two minus negative five times cosine of zero. Well, cosine of pi over two goes to zero, so our whole first expression goes to zero. Cosine of zero is one. And so we get our answer that underneath that curve over that little triangle, we've got a volume of five units cubed, whatever units we're working with. Okay, so there's a volume example over a general region. This time, let's try and find the area of a general, so-called general region, a non-rectangular region is what we really mean by general regions in the plane. So find the area of the region bounded by the upper half of the circle centered at 1, 0, with a radius of 2, and the lower half of the circle centered at 0, negative 1, with a radius 2 as well, and the vertical lines x equals plus or minus 2. And that looks like that little guy off to the right. OK, so how are we going to set this thing up? Well, once again, not lazy, but clever. I, we could try and do this whole thing. But instead, you know what I want to focus on? I want to focus on finding the area of this region and then just multiplying that by 4 and having that be our answer. So what are our slices going to work look like? Well, we could do horizontal or vertical slices. I don't know. We're kind of more used to working from left to right, letting x vary. And so I'm going to try vertical slices here. Um, and I think vertical slices, are in, they are, in fact, the right decision. 
what happens if you try to do a horizontal slice? Well, here's okay, but you're going to run into a problem right there because your slices are going to have different top and bottom, or rather different top uh, expressions. So you need to break this up into a bunch of things. So to get rid of that, I had to get rid of my highlights. So let's get that highlight. Whoops. Forgive that or red. We're just going to leave that in there. There we go. A little bit of a hot color there. There we go. That's nice. All right. So where are we going to let these slices vary over? Well, we're going to let them vary from right to left. We're going to let them go from 0 to 2 in the x direction. So dx is going to be our outermost integral. So all that logic put together means the area of this region is going to be 4 times the result of the area of what I've highlighted. And the area of what I've highlighted is, well, we just said dx was going to be our outermost integral. So with outer integral, we're going to let x vary, vary from 0 to 2. And that means our inner integral is going to vary from, well, though it's the bottom expression. Well, the differential is we're integrating with respect to y. So those should be y equals expressions. And so the bottom, I see y is equal to 0 is going to be my bottom expression. And then up here, all right, now we have to do a little bit of math. So this, this top circle, the upper half circle centered at 1, 0 of radius two is gonna have this expression, x squared plus y minus one squared is equal to four. Solving this thing for y, we are going to get y is equal to one plus or minus the square root of four minus x squared. Now, the minus part of this would be the lower part of the circle. And we don't need that. And so we need the plus version of this. So I'm going to erase that plus or minus and replace it with plus because plus corresponds to this upper half of a circle that we're after as our top. So the top expression y is equal to 1 plus square root 4 minus x squared. On, yeah, I already said it. Minus. Okay, let's slap that in our uh, integral. One plus the square root of four minus x squared. All right, and now it's time to integrate. Ready, steady, and go. Uh, our inner integral. Now this one's worthy of note that after you've done the inner and outer integral, we're gonna need to come back to the original because of our four. We have to remember to account for our four. So just keep that in mind as we're doing this. Inner integral. Uh, oh, I forgot to put y is equal to zero in there. There we go. Y varies from zero to the expression one plus the square root of four minus x squared, integrating with respect to y. That's going to give us the variable y uh, evaluated from y equals to zero to y is equal to one plus the square root of four minus x squared. Well, evaluating that, we're going to get subtract 0. So the only thing we're going to be left with is 1 plus the square root of 4 minus x squared. So there's the integrand for our outer integral. So our outer integral is going from x is equal to 0 to x is equal to 2. And we're integrating 1 plus the square root of 4 minus x squared and integrating with respect to x. So this looks like a fairly challenging integral. And how many slides do we have? Just two? Have I already used three? It says I have three. OK, we've got one, two. All right, there are three slides. All right, uh, we're going to pick up and need a little bit more room. So I will rewrite what we are working with. We are interested in the integral from x is equal to 0 to x is equal to 2 of 1 plus square root of 4 minus x squared dx. Sometimes I like to put a little tail down on my square root to emphasize where the square root ends. That's all that is. OK, it turns out to do a true, uh, can't say it without saying it, uh, to do an integral involving expressions like a squared minus x squared underneath the square root, uh, trig substitutions are going to be necessary. 
So let's go ahead and do a trig substitution. The appropriate one for this is x is equal to um, a sine of theta. And so since uh, four is underneath the root, we're going to have that be x is equal to two sine of theta. If you're watching this and thinking, oh no, he's going to ask us trig substitutions hidden in a hard double integral problem on an exam. No, I would not do that to you, at least without not without providing the scaffolding and framework to work through it um, without having to look up trick substitution. Definitely not. But for homework and for this example, absolutely. That's good practice. OK, so there's our trick substitution. Now we just have to make the substitution and see what the integrand becomes. And so what we're going to do is, well, if you're going to substitute in for x, you better also relate the differentials. So we'll take the derivative. And so the derivative of x uh, with this expression with respect to theta is going to give us dx d theta is uh, 2 cosine of theta or 2 cosine of theta times dx or d theta. All right, so those are related. And so now we need to ask ourselves the questions. We'll put a couple bullet points there because those are important. What happens to the integrand? Why does this substitution help us out? Well, we have four minus x squared underneath the root. That is going to become four minus, well, x is now two sine of theta. And so all of that is now underneath the root. Okay, so that becomes square root four minus four sine squared of theta under the root. Factor out of four. So I get one minus sine squared of theta. And that four can come outside as two. And now what is one times or uh, one minus sine squared of theta? Well, uh, re rearranging the Pythagorean identity, sine squared plus cosine squared of theta is equal to one. Subtracting sine on both sides, we see that that's the, the same thing as cosine squared. So we get cosine squared of theta underneath our root, and we're going to get two cosine of theta. So that's that's nice. That part of our integrand is going to tidy up nicely. Okay, so now that we've done that, let's go ahead and revisit our actual integral. So I'll go ahead and kind of file this off to the side there, and revisiting our actual integral, we are now going to have, well, these, our integral is going to be in terms of theta, and it's a definite integral, and I don't want to figure out the theta bounds. I'll just reverse the substitution so I can work with x and at the very end. So we're just going to put a couple dots there to remind myself that, hey, definite integral, don't forget to evaluate your bounds at the end of the uh, problem. So the one didn't change, but the square root of four minus x squared became two cosine of theta under our substitution. Now, what about dx? Don't forget, we also have to relate the differential. OK, so now, careful here. Be very, very careful here. We need to set a set of parentheses around the integrand, because the differential is going to be applied to the entire integrand. And since that differential highlighted in orange has an expression in there, we need to remember that that is going to end up being distributed to our integrand. So substituting in for dx, we get 2 cosine of theta d theta. And that comes in there. OK, now this seems like an integral we're probably going to be able to do. So let's just plow forward. Uh, distributing things, we get 2 cosine of theta plus 4 cosine squared of theta d theta. And I'm just going to recklessly write over top of that graph. It's, it's valuable real estate that we're going to need. OK, so what do we do here? Well, the first one, 2 cosine of theta, not a problem. But cosine squared, we're going to need to use those half angle formulas or whatever you like to call them, double angular formulas, to reduce the power of cosine squared down to a single power. All right, 2 cosine of theta plus 4 times 1 half plus 1 half cosine of twice theta. Uh, I 
half angle, double angle formulas. That's what that is. It's cosine squared of theta is equal to one plus cosine of two theta all divided by two. I just choose to write it as one half plus one half times cosine of two theta. All right, so now just a little bit of algebra, tidy up, keep going, and hopefully things will tidy up into something we can do now. Uh, four times one half is two, so we get two plus two cosine of two theta d theta. And there we go. Now I'm feeling pretty good that this is, in fact, an integral I can do. So what has the derivative of two cosine of theta? Well, two sine of theta has the derivative of two cosine of theta. What has the derivative of two? Well, two theta, remember, theta, not x. And then what has the derivative of two cosine of two theta? Well, you might need to do a little u substitution here, but that has um, two cosine of two theta is the derivative of sine of two theta. And we're gonna have this thing be evaluated since it's a definite integral. But instead of worrying about converting our bounds, especially since you know there are um, restrictions on angles and things, and we kind of waved our hands here when we pulled that out, didn't really note that we have to stick for a cosine between negative pi over two and pi over two to keep it positive and things, I don't know. We're just gonna say, let's reverse our substitution, get things back in terms of x. So how are we gonna do that? Well, off to the right-hand side here, we're gonna start with the original substitution and see what information we can squeeze out of that. Well, uh, x equals two sine of theta can be rewritten as sine of theta is equal to x over two. And we know sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. And so this, from this expression, we can draw ourselves a nice triangle. Stick with the orientation of the first quadrant because the first quadrant is pretty nice. So the opposite must be x and the hypotenuse must be two. Then the Pythagorean theorem will tell us that this will be four minus x squared. That will always be the original thing under the root that you used, or that was the reason that we used trig substitutions. But you should quickly write out the Pythagorean theorem and convince yourself of that. All right, so that'll let me deal with some of the stuff. I mean, that will let me deal with the first expression. But now two theta, I need to deal with theta. Well, again, from sine of theta equals x over two, we have that theta is equal to arc sine of x over two. And so that, that'll, that'll do, that'll take care of the second problem. Now, this little pesky guy, we only have a triangle for theta. We don't have a triangle for two theta. And I don't, I don't wanna try and figure it out, even if it is possible. Rather, there's a relatively nice double angle formula for this that we can use. Two sine of theta plus two theta is equal to, well, sine of two theta is the same thing as twice, whoops, that should be a plus, not an equal sign, twice sine of theta, cosine of theta, something called a double angle formula or something, or something like that. Okay, now that I can do. It may not seem like we, we know what sine of theta is, it's x over two. From this triangle, we can also come up with cosine of theta as adjacent over hypotenuse. Cosine of theta is gonna be the square root of four uh, minus x squared all over the hypotenuse of two. So yeah, sure enough, now we can substitute in for all of these values. Let's just go ahead and use some highlighters to make it a little more clear what we're doing. Red is probably a poor choice of highlighter color. Sine of, two, of theta, sine of theta is just x over two. And then last not least, theta is equal to arc sine of two. All right, making these substitutions, we have two times x over two plus two arc sine of x over two plus two times sine of theta, which is x over two times cosine of theta, which is square root of four minus x squared over two. We've got some stuff that reduces nicely away and everything tidies up a little bit nicely. We get x plus two arc sine of x over two plus x. Hey, there are two x's. Let's just write that as two x. Uh, sure, yeah. No, there are not two x's. No, don't do that. See, look up away from your notes for a second, get clever. This is not just x, this is an entire expression. That's x square root four minus x squared 
over two. Sort of thought that this was a plus or minus, not a dot. Anyway, okay, what do we need to do? Well, I'm going to not want to write this down again. So I feel like I've already used circle star once. So I'm gonna use two circle stars and say that expression is called two circle stars. And this expression needs to be evaluated from x equals zero to x equals two. I would not, unless it works out nicely, um, which I guess it might. For this type of a problem, I would most likely, yeah, ask you to give an approximate answer, but it likely has a relatively nice actual answer as well, exact answer. So why are we pausing? What am I blathering on about? I would use Desmos to evaluate this expression at x equals two and then subtract that for x equals zero. And then we come back to our original, original problem. The area was equal to four. There it is, come back to four times the result we just got, which I called circle star. And evaluating that out, we get 20.5664 units squared, not cubed, or uh, area, not volume here. And does that make sense? Kind of, don't forget regular geometry. We can give ourselves a quick check. Well, I've written all over it, so let's go to a blank one. Area 20-ish. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's 16 in there. And then well, one, two, three, four. And the tips kind of being about 20. Yeah, it seems totally reasonable. Um, so I'm convinced that our answer is correct. All right, so for our last example in this section, let's take a look at another volume calculation. We would integrate z is equal to two x times ln of y over the region of the plane bounded by x equals zero, y equals one, y is equal to x and y equals two, six. So how should we do this? Well, try vertical slices because we like vertical. Oftentimes people prefer vertical if that works. Okay, so vertical is great, great up until we hit here and then vertical is a problem because we'd have to set this up as two separate integrals, which when you're doing double integrals in a way is kind of four integrals. So let's see if we can set this up and just do one set of integration. All right, so here we go. Uh, for horizontal slices, we would have a slice like this, and a slice like that, the top and the bottom are the same all the way across the range. How would we let this vary? We'd let it vary from there to there. And so we'd let it vary in the y direction from one to six, so our outer integral is gonna be dy. So integral dy, and then y is equal to, y is gonna vary from one to six. And now on to the inner integral. So we know that our differential will be dx. And that means that our limits of integration will be with respect to x. So let's revisit our sketch and see what we can come up with. OK, so this, this line is y is equal to x. And so this will be the top. And so in terms of x, we have x is equal to y. So we've got x is equal to y for my top. And then over here at the bottom, we have x is equal to zero at that vertical line. So our lower limit of integration will be x equals to zero. Now, last but not least, don't forget our integrand. It's gonna be two x ln of y. Okay, let's take a look at this. First, as usual, tackling our inner integral. Our inner integral uh, is gonna be x varies from zero to x equals y. 2x ln of y dx. Again, because we're just starting out here, we'll highlight what we're integrating as the variable expression. Uh, you don't have to include the two, but I think it's pretty nice to as 2x is the derivative of what? x squared, uh, or you can power rule it. Same, same things will happen. All right. All right, so this is going to give us x squared ln of y, and we're going to evaluate this expression from, whoops, from x equals zero to x equals two y. That's going to give us, uh, substituting in x equals y, we have y squared ln of y 
minus, now substituting in x equals zero, we're gonna have zero squared ln of y. That whole expression goes to zero. And we have y squared ln of y as the integrand for our, for our outer integral. So our outer integral, let's see. Well, I've got more slides here and I think we're gonna need a little room. So just to kind of tidy this up, we'll have y squared ln of y. There we go. As our final conclusion for our inner integrand, just tidied up. So now let's go to the next slide uh, and continue with our outer integral. Our outer integral goes from y is equal to one to y is equal to six. Um, we have y squared ln of y dy. All right, so taking a look at this. Hmm, definitely no plain old substitution is gonna work here. And so I think we're gonna try integration by parts again. So underneath this uh, over here, I'll just kind of get us ready uh, for the integration by parts. This is going to be uv minus integral v du. Let's make that integral a little more clearly an integral sign. That looks like some kind of sideways S. So there we go. Integral signs are hard for me evidently today. Okay, so let's choose our things. We have u, uh, v, du, and dv. Let's planning uh, my use of my real estate a little bit better here. Um, u is equal to v is equal to, uh, du is equal to, and dv is equal to. Okay, so we need to choose u and v. And well, I'm tempted to, to make uh, y squared be u because it kind of gets nicer under differentiation. It's gonna take the power down, the derivative is gonna be two y, that's gonna reduce the power and, and maybe a couple applications of integration by parts would work. But then I would have to choose dv to be ln of y. And I cannot integrate ln of y. It's kind of the problem child here. And so what do you do with integration by parts when things don't work? You slap the problem child, just like we did with our arctangent example in a prior discussions. Um, you put the problem child in for this and that should say ln of y. I'm getting my v's and u's and y's all mixed up. Okay, that means that dv is going to be y squared dy, the differential is included there. So now we integrate dv, so we're going to integrate y squared dy, and that is going to give us one third y to the third power. Differentiating u, we get du, so the derivative of ln of y is one over y dy, don't forget your differentials. So these choices of u and v, uh, you know, and I'll just draw an arrow up to this equal sign to show that we're applying integration by parts here. We're going to get u times v, which I'm going to choose to write as one third y to the third power ln of y, reversing the order of u and v uh, that I have it written above because I like putting uh, logarithms and sine and functions that take an argument at the last of an expression minus integral and the integral is going to be v well that's one third y to the third power du and that's going to be times one over y dy well, that's going to tidy up pretty nicely isn't it so i'm just going to put a little red dashed line here to sort of show that that's off to the side and that this equal sign has nothing to do with that but rather is an extension of this equal sign given my limited real estate on the screen here. All right, so let's do this. Well, there's nothing to do with that first part of the expression. One third y to the third power ln of y minus integral one third. Uh, well, that's gonna be y squared. It's gonna reduce nicely for us. And that becomes a straightforward thing to integrate. So we'll do that. One third y to the third ln of y minus before we do the integration, I've been a bit lazy here, you know? 
it's definitely a definite integral. And, I, and I've shown you before that I like to kind of put dots in here sometimes. Be careful with limits uh, when you're doing a definite integral and integration by parts. You know, this should technically have be evaluated from y equals one to y is equal to six. I'm just leaving those off and we'll come back to them once all the integration has happened. All right, now that that's addressed, one third times y squared, well, the integral of y squared is another one third times y to the third. So one third times one third gives us one ninth y to the third power. All of that jazz evaluated from y is equal to one to y is equal to six. All right, now just for fun, Yep, equals one third times six to the third power ln of six minus one ninth times six to the third power minus, now we're gonna substitute in for one, one third times one to the third power ln of one minus one over nine times one to the third power. Well, this little guy, no matter what we do, is going to be kind of ugly. And so since we're going for an actual volume, I say we, we just evaluate this thing to a decimal approximation to a few decimal places. So firing up any old calculator, we're going to see that our answer is 105.1178 units to the third power. And we've done it. Does that seem reasonable? Well, going back and looking at the picture, we see that the the y-axis scale is definitely different than the x-axis scale. So sure, 105 units of volume seems about reasonable for this. And that brings this to a close.